good morning, everybody. Welcome to the session called Translating the Science of Positive Psychology to Scale. My name is Gabriel Kelly, and hands up those who were just in the room with Martin and at those presentations. They were pretty outstanding, weren't they? So we're continuing on from the previous conversation hour and the work in the Room 17 about scale. Um, I am the Director of the Wellbeing and Resilience Centre in South Australia and I'd like to welcome to the panel uh, our, other, our other members of the conversation, our Brigadier General Retired Dr John, Dr Rhonda Cornham and Mr Hector Escamilia from Tech Millennial University and of course our founder and leader Martin Seligman. Um, so Marty, in 2017 you said, and of course Martin has said a lot about these issues, but you said the world is turning from a victimology, apology-oriented view of human nature to aspirations about well-being and about flourishing. You said to us, Marty, and I speak to, as one of all of us, it's in our hands not only to witness this, but to take part in making it happen. And I put to you that all of the people in today's conversation hour have been significant players in how to make it happen. And I'm assuming that those of you in this room today are also part of the work of making it happen at scale, at various levels of scale. So the structure of this hour, it is a conversation hour. We're trying not to make it a panel, but we're still working out that form. But the structure we'll use today is, I will invite Martin to make a few opening comments, but he's just been in the session, so it will just be a few words as he chooses. And then uh, Rhonda will speak for six minutes, I will speak for six minutes, and Hector will speak for six minutes, focusing on those case studies, so that we've all got a shared understanding of each of those case studies. And then we will begin the conversation among this group about a number of key questions, which will include talking about measurement, talking about what were the biggest challenges to scale. Hands up those who are trying to do scale and find their challenges. Yeah, I think that's an issue that we all face daily for those of us who are into the implementation of positive psychology at scale. And then we'll talk about what, what could we dream could have happened differently in order to try and have a, a, a shared learning experience. So without further uh, ado, please, Martin, would you like to just say a few words? Uh, I mean, it's obvious one reason you want innovation and well-being is to spread it. But there's another deeper uh, uh, meaning of innovation in psychology. So uh, I've often uh, been involved in discussions of what should psychologists work on? What is basic to psychology? And you know, people do Pavlovian conditioning and one wonders, is that basic in any way? And uh, part of the problem is that psychology, uh, physics and chemistry had engineers that worked before they had basic research, predicted eclipses and floods and the like. So basic researchers knew what to work on. But psychology never had an engineer. So here's my one remark, introductory remark. In the 19th century, there was a, a raging controversy about how birds flew in physics. And there was all sorts of theories about how birds flew. And uh, this was settled in 28 seconds in uh, 1903. The Wright brothers built an airplane and it flew. So people said, ah, that's how birds fly. Uh, the point of innovation in many ways is if, build, if you can build something that works, then it tells those of us who do basic science what we should be working on. And all three of the people who will be talking today have built something that works. Okay, my first disclaimer is I am not a psychologist. Um, I, am, I am by training a biochemist and a urologist. And uh, did spend 34 years in the Army, so I know a little bit about beating troops. And, um, and that's how we're here. So I was asked to talk about how we implemented um, what we call comprehensive soldier fitness in the Army. I want to give you a little background on the Army um, because I know that part of the interest is in how much it costs and how big it is. Um, the Army in the United States has an annual budget of about $150 billion. We have 1.2 million people in the service, counting our active duty uh, Guard and National Guard and Reserve forces. 
And, um, and we turn over, and so I have to bring in new people. We turn over about 10% per year, whether they retire, they just finish their enlistment, they get out for whatever reason. And so we bring in about 130,000 people a year. And that is at a cost total in terms of recruiting of about $2 billion a year. So you can imagine that if we could reduce the need to bring that many people in, if we had less attrition, uh, that would save a significant amount of money. So there's the baseline of the Army. We started this project about psychological building psychological health starting in 2008. Um, by that, at that time, uh, we had been in the war on terror for about seven years. Most, many people had gone multiple times, either to Iraq and or Afghanistan. Um, everybody who was coming in, those 130,000 people we brought in every year, they all knew on their first assignment they were probably going to go to war. And, and so um, you can imagine that there was no good news in the world because we had just come off of basically you know, 40 years of, of the Army's a really safe place to be since Vietnam, you know, frankly. And so, so being at war for seven years was not going all that well, and, and everything was getting worse. It was suicide, depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, drug and alcohol abuse, spouse abuse, uh, sexual assault, pretty much anything you could measure when was not improving. And the chief of staff, I was at the time the assistant surgeon general, and he looked at me at one of these, another, yet another meeting about mental health, and he said, Rhonda, we have got to do something besides what we're doing, which is just finding and treating more people. I said, yes, sir, we do. We need to have some kind of program to make people more psychologically fit. Because the data has been pretty clear that, that pro those problems don't, ran they're not like manna from heaven. They don't randomly attack. Um, it's people who, who are at the, you know, a little more psychologically fragile. They may not have a disease, they may have a disorder, but, but they're not the most psychologically robust. So we said, let's make, a, let's make a plan and let's apply it to every soldier. And we want people, he said, and this is one of my teaching points, you need to have something that everybody wants to aspire to or they won't participate. He said, we want to have an army that's as psychologically fit as it is physically fit. Everybody should be able to get behind that. That's what every, that's what every commander wants, is a, as a group of people that are that way. And, um, and then we changed, we ultimately that kind of morphed into, we want to create and to enhance the, we want everybody to be as physically fit, mentally tough, and emotionally strong as they can be. Now you will notice those are not militarily relevant or unique things, they are people things. That's what we want people to do. We want them to carry those strengths with them wherever they go. So that's what we started to do. And um, so we needed an assessment program. We needed a training program that could enhance those. And we needed buy-in at all levels. And that was one of the other teaching points is, if you're going to do this, you've got to have the guy at the very top who's enthusiastic about it and believes in it. If you don't, just don't waste your time if you, if you don't have that. Um, and then you have to have a strategic comms plan to get everybody else on board. And um, as, as the Chief of Staff said, he said, I may be the Chief of Staff of the Army, and I can tell somebody something, but I still have to convince them to do it. Um, if there's a lot of layers between that four-star general and that private at basic training. And, um, and so a, a plan to convince, to, to get everybody else on board is, is, I think, really one of the key things to do. So when you look at return on investment, so how much did it cost versus how much could we save? Um, well, we probably so we spent probably um, the first year on doing this thing in terms of getting a training program, getting an assessment program. We probably spent fifteen million dollars. Let's remember we spent over two billion bringing people in. So, so if I can do something, that's that's really that's really not that expensive, and um, and I. Think that that um, you have to be willing. First of all, I think measurement is important, and we're going to talk about that later. But um, but you have to be willing uh, to really spend a lot of a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of, and you have to sell it to every one of your stakeholders. You have to sell it to Congress or your government or your school or whoever you have. We unfortunately had everybody, so we had to sell it to the families of recruits, we had to sell it to the, our Congress and, and Senate, and, um, 
and healthcare providers. I can't believe how much healthcare providers were were upset that somehow they thought I don't know whether they were unemployed or what. There was plenty of business for everybody. Um, you know, we didn't we didn't put any clinical psychologists out of business by doing this program. I assure you. Um, so so you got to get people really on board, and that takes a lot of thought. And then once you once you've got this plan, you have to execute it immediately. You can't string it out. You have to get everybody at once because if you don't, you will have the naysayers who will um, who will sabotage you. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think as we all speak, you're going to hear some repeated themes. And uh, Martin talked about building something that works. And this is a story about us trying to build something that's working in South Australia to build wellbeing at scale. We have a population of 1.4 million. So far, we've measured 95,000 people in wellbeing. And we have projects that we expect to reach about 119,000 by the end of next year. We have projects in government, state and local, in business, in aged care, in schools, in emergency services, and in manufacturing. We are deliberately setting out to become known as the state of wellbeing and deliberately setting out to build the wellbeing of the whole population, to become a global leader in research about wellbeing and to build a wellbeing industry. Well industry. That's our, our mission. So how did this come about? I want to talk to you about the, uh, I want to pick up that point about Ron, that Rhonda said about people needing to want it. Basically we had to set and train a pretty sneaky method for making people want this because at the political level people did not want this. Now I've been a filmmaker and I've worked in digital media and innovation and now wellbeing and for a long time I've been, well actually all of my career I've been wondering about how can you improve the capacity of human beings alone and together to live peacefully, to make good decisions and to live within planetary limits. That's what's animated my whole career really as a communicator and policy, you know, I'm, not, I'm a generalist, a deep generalist. But in particular, I asked myself over many years whether we could deliberately build people's psychological health. I was involved in the human potential movement. I was a participator in the self-help revolution in the 80s and 90s. But there didn't seem to be a clear way to reach scale with the information that seemed to be becoming available for professionals and wealthier people until positive psychology was born and the evidence for how to build well-being in people began to be marshaled and developed by Martin and the positive psychology community. I knew it was only at that point that you had any chance of making any political, we want to do this. That was the, it was absolutely dependent upon the arrival of the evidence base, so positive psychology was critical in it. At that time I was running a, a program called the Adelaide Thinkers in Residence, which brought in world leaders to help South Australia solve difficult, complex social problems, and I wanted to take this question of building psychological health to that innovation methodology through the Adelaide Thinkers in Residence program. So in 19, 2010, I invited Martin to come and be an Adelaide Thinker in Residence. It took us, he was good enough to accept, he liked the challenge. Uh, it took us a year and a half to get the finance to pay for that work because there were, it was seen as politically very risky and we had to go through a lot of hills and dales. We had to attract investors. We got the South Australian Department of Health and Education and the Premier's Department and St Peter's College and four other investors came on board and we had our residency going. And Martin came for two full months in 2011 and 2012. We worked him ruthlessly, and we curated a ruthless program. He's nodding. <laughs> and Martin spoke to the Premier, he spoke to the Cabinet, he spoke to leaders in education, psychology, psychiatry, and the teaching professions, and he engaged 14,000 South Australians in what was really a blitzkrieg of a message, which is that well-being is measurable, teachable, and learnable. And by the time Martin had left, he was our tactical he was our tactical leader in making people want this. By the time he left South Australia, generally speaking, people were not saying, oh, that's rubbish, oh, it's pop psychology, oh, it's only for women, oh, you know, oh, we couldn't do it, oh, it's impossible. By the time he left, there was an appetite and a torrent of motivated leaders that were already established. So within two years after Martin gave his recommendations, and he was talking about processes of persuasion, democracies are not armies. It's not a command and control economy. And you, you've explained that even in the army it wasn't easy. Well, let me tell you, in a democracy, it's less easy. You have to work towards the co creating a coalition of the willing at every single level of scale, from state government to local government to bosses of organisations, and there will be people who fight you on the way. 
So Rhonda's point about communication of the ideas, persuasion, inspiration and leadership is completely critical. And Martin, of course, gave us an incredible boost because of the power of his science and the authority of his voice. So we opened the Wellbeing and Resilience Centre about a year and a half after Martin's recommendations. It took us that much time to find a home and we launched with that mission to build South Australia as a state of wellbeing as a prototype for the world. First thing we had to do, and I'll go quickly through this, was decide on our measurement. We decided that the research around PERMA, the dashboard of wellbeing, was good. We'd also seen, and something that Alejandro talked about a lot, was localising. You have, to, you have to talk with your community and understand what your community wants, what language is acceptable to them. For example, happiness wasn't acceptable to South Australia. If we'd tried to launch an institute of happiness, we wouldn't have gone anywhere. And Wellbeing and Resilience is not at all an elegant name, but it's a name that worked for us. And now we've married Wellbeing and Resilience scientific concepts and that language in South Australia. Everyone uses Wellbeing and Resilience together. It's married conceptually. So we decided on PERMA, but we also wanted to measure and pay attention to resilience. So we have a measure which we call PERMA Plus, which includes PERMA and optimism and physical activity, nutrition and sleep, because we thought the evidence linking uh, health to mental wellbeing was also very important. So we call it PERMA Plus. It's deliberately roomy, it means we can add other measures into it when we need to. Our vision is that we will see PERMA Plus on the back of buses in public artworks, our idea is that we want PermaPlus to work as a measure, um, framework and a mean in the society. In Australia, we have taken the science of skin cancer and we've embedded it in the culture under the name Slip Slop Slap. Every pet mother in Australia knows that you don't bake your baby in the sun, you slip on the t-shirt, slap on the hat and slop on the... So anyway, you get the drift. We would, we would, our goal is to make PERMA Plus do that, be a water carrier for the concepts of how to improve your health, your mental health. So first thing, measurement. Second thing, intervention. We've been privileged to have Rhonda come to Adelaide five times now, and Hector, you've come once. So, you know, these are my friends and colleagues in the leadership of this. They helped us break down the doors of resistance to these concepts. And we were very interested in the Comprehensive Soldier Fitness Program, which run Rhonda One, because the evidence base of efficacy was good, but it was also a scale program. And we started off with scale in mind. Well-being at scale was our intent from the beginning that flowed precisely out of Martin's engagement with us. So we're working with a company that Rhonda has an association with called TechWorks LLC, and we have licensed the 10 resilience skills from that company, which we have taken as our primary and first intervention that we're using. We're also producing an intervention called Perma Plus of our own. What we loved about that was the precision nature of the skills. I say to all the classes that we run, when you learn CPR, you don't walk out of the room and start making up your own version of, of, of CPR. So we, we are very seriously interested in fidelity to the science and we love the way the TechWorks work uh, honours that and we have picked up that same concept. So first measurement, second intervention, third process. You can run as many single courses for as many single people as you want, and I don't think it's going to have any effect at scale. If you don't pay attention to systems change at the same time as you pay attention to delivery of the information, I don't think anything's going to happen. So picking up on Rhonda's idea too, we have a process, an implementation process, if you like, a theory of change, our implementation model, which we call the lead, measure, build and embed approach in a research framework. Very straightforward, <laughs> very easy to understand. You can't do it without leaders. You can't do it if you don't think about embedding it beforehand. You can't do it if you don't tactically communicate and then you must measure well-being first, which Martin clearly instructed us to do and which we always do, um, and then you, then you think about building. But if you just get enthusiastic, which I must say all of our people in South Australia do, they get hysterically enthused about doing this. And everybody wants to run off and do it and start teaching positive psychology themselves. Not necessarily having done any training in the area, I might add. Um, but that doesn't do anything. You really need to encourage people to take a breath and think systematically about the needs of their cohorts, whether they're aged cohorts, school cohorts, manufacturing cohorts, etc. So we have the measurement, we have the intervention, we have the approach, lead, measure, build, and embed. Let me give you an example of how it's working best in South Australia. We have a partnership with the prison system, the whole of the prison system, 2,500 workforce, 12,000 people inside and around the prison system. 
but there's no point starting with the clients of the prison system, the prisoners, unless you've built the wellbeing in the culture of the prison system. So we have a three-year lead measure build and embed project with the whole of the prison system, and after one year we're already seeing significant improvements in wellbeing across that whole workforce, but particularly, of course, unsurprisingly, particularly among the people who've received the training. So we are going to transform and build the wellbeing of the whole prison system in South Australia, and that suits the objectives of the prison system, which is to reduce recidivism by 10% within two or three years, and they see building wellbeing and resilience as a mechanism for doing that, and that's why they've invested. We're working with over uh, many, many schools, 200 or so schools, 93% of the whole population of South Australian children in government schools have been measured in wellbeing. We've hit at least 1,500 teachers and at least 20,000 students. Not every school is doing the perfect example. In fact, Martin, you told us, don't wait to build. Don't only build the Rolls Royce version of this, be prepared to go with the Volkswagen version. Well, people, not everyone will even buy the Volkswagen version, you know, but nevertheless, you, you help people to get on the journey and you get as many exemplars in the best process that you can as possible. And we've got many schools in the Catholic system, the government school system and the private system building wellbeing in a very systematic way. We've got a relationship with the Vocational Education Organisation. It's one we're very proud of. They have, we're doing a workforce project with their staff and they're doing a presentation here. They're called TAFE SA. So we're working to build the wellbeing of 2,000 staff. But what we're really after is the 80,000 students across 49 campuses. Now, we can't go straight to the students. We're going to be disciplined enough to go to the workforce first. That's going to take a couple of years, but we will get to those 49 campuses. So we're working in prisons, we're working in ageing with 70 projects and 4,000 older people involved, and we have a million dollar philanthropic investment in a project for 1,200 disadvantaged young people who are not in school, not in training, and are really stuck in their life. And we are, and we are adding the trauma-informed and intentional practice work to the resilient skills to uh, really hit that group, and so far it's coming along very well. At the moment, we estimate we've got 10,000 people in organisations involved in wellbeing projects with the workforce. So they're in banks, they're in schools, they're in universities, they're in manufacturing, they're in organisations, and they're in the public sector. So, Marty, you did say build a Volkswagen. We have a compelling Volkswagen. We're trialling it across the whole society at scale. We're learning, we're adapting, we're changing, we're growing. We are completely determined to build the state of wellbeing by building psychological skills across the whole society and then see what impact that has on our society. Uh, people say, and I agree, that people routinely overestimate what you can get done in one year and underestimate what you can get done in 10. We're not doing that and we have a 10 year plan, we're five years in. Martin was the door kicker for us to be able to make you with a tactical advantage that allowed us to get the political will behind us. We've grown from two people to 25 people and 200,000 to uh, 8.4 million of money that we've attracted as a startup in this society, moving on that sort of tide of enthusiasm uh, to build the state of wellbeing in South Australia. Thank you. Good day. Uh, my name is Hector Escamilla. I'm from Mexico. I run in Tech Millennium University. In the world, there is more than 20,000 universities. Imagine if you could redesign your own university, your own college you went to. What would you do? So this is what we did in the year 2012. In Mexico, there's more than 3,000 universities, and uh, we wanted uh, not to be better than other universities, but to be unique. So to be unique, we ask some questions. Uh, basically, we say in academia, we know all, we know what to do. But the first question we say is, how a university, a university should be in the 21st century? Who are our stakeholders? What are the, the, their needs? And so we redesigned the whole university based on the needs of the parents, the needs of the students of the Generation Z, we redesigned the university in based on the needs of the industry and the trends in the world. And for us, 
Imagine a university, if you live up to 100, uh, when you go to college, mostly everybody tells you the most important thing is go to college. But college for you or anybody else is only four to five years. So that means it's only four to five percent of your life. So the most important thing is not to go to college. The most important thing is what would you do when you are 22, from the year 22 up to the year 72 years that you will be working? What will make you wake up with energy, with passion to do what you love, and something that makes your life worthwhile living? So we say, why did we design a university which is flexible? Flexible, which provides the opportunity for the students to choose courses, not to be just like Henry Ford, like uh, uh, design all the courses and pass all of them and get a degree. What if we provide, you? so we analyze the flexibility of the universities in the world that range from 8% up to 27% engineering and business. So well, we decided to go up to 40. So 40% of the curricula you can choose. So we are empowering the students to design their own degree. The other thing is, what is the most important thing for parents? The most important thing as a parent is that your education provides your son or daughters a job. The most important thing for your parents is that they could be able to get a job after graduation. And the other thing we say is, what is the most important thing in life? The most important thing in life is to be happy. And then we say, what if we redesigned our university around the well-being and happiness of the individuals. And then we start discovering and being inspired by great friends like Martin. We get inspired by Martin Seligman. We got, we got inspired by James Pawelski, Kim Cameron, David Cooper Ryder, and many old good friends. They, they got, got us to inspire and say, and discover this great field of positive psychology. So we decided to redesign the whole university and create what we call an ecosystem of well-being and happiness. And the ecosystem of well-being and happiness, of course, is based on the Paramount model that Martin developed. But we decided to add up two more things. The wellness part, resting, dining correctly, and exercising. And the other element of our ecosystem is uh, mindfulness. So, and inside that the ecosystem redesigned all uh, services provided to the students, <laughs> all the curricular, co curricular activities, the training of the leaders and teachers of the university, and also the curricula. So, with all these things, we just redesigned what we call and live an ecosystem of well being and happiness. Like, if you go to Disney, they act like Disney, they dress like Disney, and they treat you like Disney. <laughs> we, are, we, are not, we are not there yet, but we are working on it. We've been working for years and a half in this well-being and, well -being and uh, happiness ecosystem where everything is centered on the well-being and happiness of their students. But at the same time, we say, well, it's not the students, it's also the leaders, the faculty, of the university, we all have to be living in the whole ecosystem. And by the way, the most important person in a university is the student, not necessarily the president, not necessarily even the professor. So we got inspired by this great field of uh, positive psychology and introduced it. And let me uh, give you an example. We have 29 campuses. We are, we are a private, non-for-profit university in Mexico. We were created in the year 2002. So we are, we are only 15 years. And introducing the well-being and happiness ecosystem, we are only five years. So we introduced this, we have 29 campuses, so we have to do extensive training of every single president. So, so we have to reinvent our style of leadership and we have moved from 32,000 students, we are serving now 55,000 uh, 55, students in, in the country. It's a, it's a major challenge, and we are really happy to discover what we call today a positive university. A positive university, which means how can you become the best self 
and with everything and services are centered on your on your well-being and happiness and to develop as we say in our vision we declare our vision like, like you see in every single industry everybody defines their vision and this is the beacon of the energy the beacon for concentrating all the efforts our vision as a university is to prepare people with a purpose in life and competencies to achieve your purpose in life. So everything we do is concentrated in being your best self, but also to develop your purpose in life. And developing your purpose in life is also it has to be with helping other people to develop their all their own purpose in life and well-being and happiness, helping other people. Finally, one more comment. If you want to know more, you know I have a a slide presentation that we'd be glad to share through Gabriel. And also one thing that just happened a month ago, Mark Zuckerberg, the commencement ceremony at Harvard was about purpose in life. So we believe that in education, one of the things that we learned from Marty is that happiness can be teachable. We have to measure it, we are measuring everything, and we are being tracking uh, university and uh, be glad to share more details, but uh, it's been a great journey that is not, not only transformed the life of the students, but it's also transforming the life of the leaders and my life. Thank you so much. So that's the opening set of the case studies for this conversation. And uh, we agreed that we'd like to begin the conversation to focus on measurement at first, since we all think it's really important. Ron, would you like to let now this we're going to treat as a conversation? That means if you want to ask a question, yes. please do. Yes. Um, well, first of all, measurement, because I was perfect, started off a scientist, you know, I, I was unwilling to do something. Can everybody hear? Okay. Um, that we didn't measure because I had. Can been, you hear back there, Chris? Yes. Yes. No. I had been forced many times in my life to take stuff I knew didn't work, and I was unwilling to be a part of making other people do that. So, so a measurement, a plan, as you implement something to measure its effectiveness, I thought was critical, and and it's critical for even the individual doing it. They want to be able to see that whatever they're doing is working. Um, you know, if you're dieting, you want to be able to weigh yourself and see that you're losing weight. If you're, if you're going to the gym, you want to be able to work out and say, oh, I can bench press more. So, so it's the same thing with psychological fitness. Um, the other thing is that when we talk about um, the things that are easy to measure are not what are most useful to measure. Because the easy things to measure are all those negatives, all the rates all the rates of people getting arrested or doing drugs or beating up their spouses or or whatever negative indiscipline they're doing but those are easily measured and and we already measured them so um so it was important we thought if we could incorporate those measures uh, we would and happily um we did show a reduction in um in in uh, drug and alcohol use and in uh, and in all mental health disorders, in those people who had deployed after the training compared to those people who didn't get it. It wasn't a huge difference, but you know, 1% of a million in people is still a lot of people. So if you can decrease all the bad stuff, um, which is not really the goal, but if you can do it, that does help you sell it. Because everybody wants to do that. Um, I'm going to talk. Can I say one more thing? Sure. Um, when you're, if you're going to try to do this, I would recommend you really look at your audience and, and for example, we had the five things. We had five types of fitness. We had physical, emotional, social, family, and spiritual. Now, I think those are important. The World Health Organization thinks those are important. In hindsight, I would have left out spiritual. I would have still measured it but I would not have advertised it because I spent half my time deflecting attacks <laughs> about that from all sides, from the military atheists, from the chaplains, from everybody. And it was just painful. 
So we talked about whether we should call it that, and everybody believes kind of that, that spiritual fitness is important, and spiritual strength is important. We all believe that. You need to find a different word. Um, go ahead. Could I just ask uh, two questions, please? Where is that research? Because I've been searching for your research because I knew from Marty's book that it had begun, but haven't been able to find the data because I've been requested in my community to help. And, that, and then the second question is, I heard you, Gabrielle, say that there is a commercial entity that you use that you recommend to implement the resilience variables that came from your study. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah. Uh, yes. We have. We we carefully parceled out which of the skills we taught, or which things that improved um, based on the skills we thought. And, and so we teach those, and sort of we left out some things that didn't seem to be very important. Okay, so the two things, where's your research and that? Right, research, um, the initial stuff which we did, which showed um, uh, on a big scale, were not done. I mean, they were done, and they were published, but they're published not in randomized controlled trials. They're published in, a, it, it's called a tech, a, a um, technical. technical report. They're available anywhere. Um, but in order to have done it the way what you're discussing, I would have tried to get informed consent of every single soldier in the United States Army. Right. So we measured it because we measure everything in the Army. And they, you know, that explains why I haven't been that's able to find that's why you won't find it. And then, but they are available. There's another reason you can't find it. To, the right research would have had a control group right. that didn't get comprehensive soldier fitness. But the program became popular so fast yeah. that the Army rolled it out to everyone and we lost the control group. Yeah, we, uh, we intended to follow a group of people who didn't get training for like three years and we made it to about 14 months and then their commanders were going to shoot me if I didn't <laughs> send them. <laughs> and then the commercial entity that you recommend? Well, um, I, am, I am a uh, member, I'm the director of health strategy for a company called TechWorks. TechWorks, thank you. And it's, it's on the way. The, the people in back might want to come yeah. up front so you can hear the their seats up front. Yeah. And not everybody may be as loud as I am. Feel free. <laughs> uh, yes, we, we're still on measurement now. Yes, sir. Could I, I have a question that's kind of, it's, it's, it's a little bit maybe more philosophical than that. Because I, I work in a, in a college of surgeons, so we produce doctors for, who come from 70 different countries to train with us, and they go back to their countries. And we're seeing a huge problem with stress in medicine. And it's not, it's, this is, part of that is to do with the structures of our healthcare organizations. So my question is really, how do you strike a balance between creating resilient graduates for toxic organizations? And what, does, that, does that let the organizations off the hook for having to actually change? You know, there, there's, a, there's a really complicated balance between the individual and the organization, because individuals are nested uh, in organizations. I, I know you probably have thought a lot about that. Well, there's stuff going on in medicine that, that uh, you should know about. Um, so about a year ago, the Yale Medical School uh, came to us and asked, said, you know, our, our problem is burnout of physicians. Uh, what can we do? Can we take the kinds of programs that, that uh, all three of our speakers have talked about and apply them to medicine? So we were uh, right at the end of having developed a curriculum, a medical curriculum to prevent burnout in physicians, and at the same time, um, I was approached by number 10 in the National Health Service in, in the UK, again, the problem being burnout, not only of physicians, but of the whole people sure. in all of healthcare delivery. So uh, at the moment, the UK and the NHS is very interested in programs like this with the target of burnout in physicians. Okay. And then just the final element of this, the new president of the American College of Physicians, I'm uh, speaking to his board next week, wants to make uh, the rejuvenation of people in healthcare a central theme. And I think the sorts of thing that's being talked about today um, is just ripe to be brought to the medical community. Uh, and we have a project going for 500 members of the South Australian Health Service, and we are just about to start working with doctors as well, using that same kind of approach. Uh, let's just keep going a little bit on research. We will open up to 
uh, apart from measurement. Oh, okay, now we won't. Yes, yes. Um, Felicia? <laughs> Um, yeah, yes. Um, in, in terms of measurement, it's great to measure a lot of domains, as you've mentioned. But I wonder what you think about also using a wide variety of measures. It's something that we're doing now. So obviously you do self-report, you do some of those objective markers maybe of problems. But, but there's also the qualitative, which is just as important. But also we're doing things like ethnographic observation, using anthropologists to help us with that. We're also doing objective tests of, let's say, decision-making or empathy. And we're also, um, for example, using social network analysis, it was described this morning, to look at the ripple effect of people who've had this training yeah. and what effect it has on the people around them. So, I mean, I just wonder what you feel about the um, opportunities to use a wide breadth of measures. I think it's essential. I don't think you can use one without the others if you want to get the full picture. And sometimes the time goes slowly and, you, and your yearly measures are too slow, but you might want to do focus groups in order to be informing what you're doing. So, but what do you think, Hector? No, I, I, I agree with you. We have to use different measurements. I don't believe we, do, we still utilize all of them, but uh, we have find like, levels of engagement of people. Yeah, that's, that, that's a great measurement that we have. We, since we introduce uh, well-being and happiness to the curricula and the training to certify faculty leaders, we are measuring levels of engagement through other instruments like Connexa from, it's a, it's a well-being uh, and, uh, and uh, it's a company that helps you to measure engage levels of engagement. We have been able to contrast uh, with Perma you know, remember, we have 29 campuses, so sometimes we have excellent leaders and sometimes we don't. Mm -hmm. So when we have the extremes, we can correlate excellent leadership and, mm -hmm. and great PERMA levels in the students, and we have uh, poor leadership and poor PERMA levels in the, in the students. So there's a direct impact there. And um, of course, we like to measure as much as possible. And we have measured also data that in our universities, we also have the last three years of high school. So we, can be, we have been able to measure the impact of the education of our own high school versus other high schools on the first year of college. So the level of the academic level of our students is significantly higher than high school students that come from other uh, high schools. And this is just the beginning. We created a well-being and happiness institute to do the scientific measurements, and uh, we'll be glad to share more. Uh, along with me, there's a couple of people here that may describe with more detailed information. I'd, al I'd also like to add that without measurement, you can't sustain it. If you can't produce the evidence that the money you have to invest to do this pays off, this will fall flat and stop. And you won't, in a democracy, you won't survive the change of government if there's a change set of policies at the top unless you've got evidence that this works. And because we began as a startup, we had to, people had to pay for our service. Uh, we weren't able to give our services away and many people are buying these services of wellbeing because they want something else. They want better academic performance or they want reduced absenteeism. And you, you actually have to walk with different communities of people to help serve their strategic goals when you know uh, already from evidence that this work will help those goals. So, for example, in a manufacturing company we're working with, they're a manufacturing company that's closing and leaving the country because they're the car industry. The 200 people in the workforce are, all have already lost their jobs, but they're in, in work still. But there was an uh, improvement of well-being after a 14-week program of 12%. But over that year, the company told us there was a improvement, reduction in absenteeism of 43%, and a reduction in misdemeanors of 23% and improved productivity of three measures out of five that they value. So each group, each cohort, has each organisation has its things it cares about. And if you can strategically align this well-being work with those measurements, it, it's interesting for them. And they will invest and commit. A question? I'll just leave you there. Yeah. Um, my question is about a research tool for using positive psychology in the classroom. I'm a teacher and a curriculum designer. I am not a researcher. <laughs> and so the, does TechWorks, does that apply to the curriculum for middle school and high school students? What I 
be able to use that as a tool, or does anyone have something that you can recommend? I'm sure there is a tool. I've got, um, I, I, I'm gonna, I will refer you to Jill. Yes, yes, yes. Who is, who is they they do have a version of the TechWorks Resilient Skills for Young People yes, yes. that has been developed by the company. And but, uh, well, we have a research psychologist who runs that part of the company, and that's not me. I think the larger scale uh, validation is Alejandro Adler's work yes. that he talked about before. So there yes. are a number of K through 12 curricula right. around the world that can be applied. and the. The clearinghouse is IPEN, the International Positive oh, yeah, Education Network. Yeah. Uh, I may add, uh, along with me is Luis. Raise your hand, please, Luis. He's the academic provost, so he's in charge of the designing in the programs of the last two years of high school and college, and all the measurements that we were talking, he has the data. Okay, thank you. And the impact on the programs. Thank you so much. Can I ask the panel, too, um, what were the biggest challenges? in the work you've been doing? <laughs> I mean, I know there's many, but... The, the, the major challenge, I myself am a horticulturist, so I'm prime science <laughs> major. <laughs> so I came to Michigan State to study horticulture. And then uh, the major challenge first was to understand what is the meaning of positive psychology and lead by example and be certified yourself. So these things start top down. So if you really want to change an organization, you need to be convinced top down and uh, cascading and uh, you know, train the trainers. And of course, uh, and we have, since we have through the country 29 campuses uh, from the north to Cancun. So we have to really get together. So we get to meetings every week. We get meetings every month meetings every year to align the whole organization. So it's a training, following up, and measuring, and that being, uh, and also uh, be dealing to change your style of leadership. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I can tell you, I've been working 31 years in education, uh, as in different parts from faculty to president of this university. So the most important thing is being able to, to learn and lead by example, which means I am, every, I am a very result-oriented person. But I found myself that the things that helped me in the past to be successful or reaching daily numbers and getting results didn't help to be and become a positive leadership. So we, we discovered not just positive psychology, now how you can translate as a positive management, positive leadership, and today, we have a great relationship with industry in Mexico. They say, they say, Hector, you and I have the same problem, engagement and positive leadership in organization. And uh, so today, we have opened a master's in positive leadership and, uh, in Mexico City and Monterrey. And hopefully, in two years, we'll be online. Great. Mavi, did you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, here's something I've never said before. But it, it is, I think, the greatest barrier to what all of us are interested in. I'm gonna call it a, a, a the moral vision. I think we have, we're stuck with a popular myopic moral vision. And so here's a story that's a metaphor for it. Uh, about five years ago, Bill Moyers, who's a dean of uh, American journalism, came to speak at my university, and I was labeled as the discussant. So Bill got up and said, the function of journalism is to uncover what's hidden. And that is talk. That's what journalism should be. And so in my discussion, I said, um, Bill, um, uh, imagine that journalism was completely successful and you uncovered everything that was hidden. And even better, you corrected everything that was wrong and hidden. Where would you be? Where would we be? I said, at zero. That not getting it wrong is not equivalent to getting it right. What is the positive moral vision of journalism? That is, we know what to condemn, but do we know what to praise? And I think all of us have a positive moral vision. So I believe that we've been stuck in politics, 
in religion, in journalism, we're trying to get rid of the bad stuff. Well, getting rid of the bad stuff is just not enough. I think we need a moral vision that says we want to build the good stuff. And the absence of the bad stuff is not equivalent to, build, to the presence of the good stuff. So if you correct everything that's wrong in your children, you don't get an exemplary child. What you have to do is build strengths and perma and the like. So I think we're lacking in the world a moral vision that's not just about getting rid of what's wrong, but building what's right. And I think uh, notions like perma, character, strengths, are quite exactly what we mean about what's right. And so the program that I want for the, this planet in the future is the building of flourishing. And it can't be achieved by a moral vision that says somehow flourishing occurs automatically if you get rid of everything that's wrong. Marty, that's a great point. And I think it relates to this gentleman's point about yeah. toxic systems. You asked, What's the point of building well-being in people if they go and work in toxic systems? But the reimagining of systems, the refreshing of systems, it, it, it really is something that will flow from the work you do about envisioning what's right. Yeah, it and, it, and it can't be changed just by order from the top. Yeah, it sort of reminds you, as, as, as reminds me as an aging psychologist of Hertzberg. You know, yeah. just starting out the dissatisfaction does not leave you with satisfied no, happy people. Right. You need the, the motivators. The hygiene, yeah. yeah. Um, yes. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm trying to Big take. Voice. I'm trying to take all of this and synthesize it into an articulate question with everything that's <laughs> converging in my brain. But um, I, I am wondering. I think I, I think I'm aware of a lot of the challenges around moving forward. Um, but I see great opportunity, especially in the developing world, for moving forward with positive psychology, specifically positive education with digital technology and I, there's built-in ways to measure right um, the implementation of certain interventions and techniques and things like that but I'm a little bit discouraged by the lack of access or maybe I'm just not connected to the right people of digital technology that can be implemented um, not even just in the developing world but in the developed world um, that's any sort of uh, like intuitively user-friendly or aesthetically appealing or anything like that um, and without those <coughs> characteristics I think it won't pick up and and rapidly scale to the level of opportunity that's available to us so what I'm wondering is do you do any of you in your connections or your sectors of the world see people that are really brilliantly developing a way forward uh, with digital technology in implementing uh, positive psychology and positive education. Yes, I think there are many people who are doing it. Um, the evidence is not absolutely clear that digital technology alone results in building well-being, but hybrid solutions of face-to-face -face and technology seem to be working effectively, and there's new, new products and services coming every day online. Darren, would you like to add to that? No. No? Okay. <laughs> Uh, Arca, 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 I heard yeah. Parks is her last name. Acacia Parks. But Parks. there is a huge amount of work going on. Uh, in China, there's an organization called Happiness Lab, Health, Happiness and Harmony. They've been set up entirely to build well-being applications. Uh, we'll be launching that in Australia very soon. But there are many, many people working in learning management systems. We're, we're spending a million dollars on a new technology platform ourselves, which will be ready in six months or four months or something. So I think the space is going ballistic. The question of quality, user interface, appropriateness, cultural relevance, etc., they're all critical questions. But, but, but keep looking. There are a lot of really good stuff. I may add, uh, there is excellent tools in mindfulness yeah. mm -hmm. and in the world. Yeah. But, but I believe that the, one of the major challenges, going back to your question, is how do you become it a habit, and how do you make it a culture? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like uh, you and I know English, but we, that doesn't mean that you know our culture or I know your culture. So the most important thing in schools, industry, uh, or universities, is how you make all these things happening in harmony uh, to become a culture with rituals, 
one of the things that Marty told me when we were starting this, we are, we are, no, we are not there yet. Marty told me, the day when you have your professors really uh, in charge of making uh, of your students their best self mm -hmm. and bringing up their strengths yeah. in the classroom, then you will consolidate the university. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are not there yet. It may take four or five more years because it's really uh, feeling it from inside that you really not want to teach mathematics. You really want to bring the best of the people to become their best selves. So the challenge, the major challenge is culture. And I agree with that. We are finding sometimes we are teaching manufacturers resilience skills. On the first day of the lesson, they are very suspicious of the skills. They go home and talk about their work at the table at night, and their child says, oh, we're doing that at school. Mm -hmm. And the dad says, oh, OK. And then the family talks about the skill. The dad comes back the next morning and goes, this is fantastic, <laughs> and then participates in the rest. So that's the kind of network effect you get if you go cohort by cohort across the life course, workforces, schools, aged care organisations, communities, volunteers, emergency services, suddenly you get that ripple effect beginning to have that cultural impact. Um, one strange factor, I was a tiny part of the anti-smoking campaign 40 years ago, and the inflection point in the campaign, everyone knew that cigarettes killed you. Everyone knew that it was bad to do. But the inflection point was when it became dirty, uh, uh, filthy, disgusting. Uh, when it got under the cognitive radar to this limbic system that said smoking is disgusting. OK, what's the opposite of that for well-being? Well, I think everyone knows well-being is good for you. Everyone wants to have it. But I think it has to be sexy and attractive and get under this cognitive radar. And uh, I don't know how to do that, but the equivalent of making well-being sexy, erotic in the large sense of eros, I think is, is something that would be great if we could think of how to do it. Well, I think it does it itself, actually, rather than that's why people get almost a road to Damascus feeling when they first come across it. They become filled with emotion and energy and drive, and it's quite it's quite palpable. I'm not I'm not saying it's quite easy. Yeah, and and, and uh, many of the people I work with, almost all the math students, and probably many. Well, I'll try it. Uh, how many of you feel called to be here? <laughs> yeah. uh, that's sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I rest my case. Um, on that note, everybody, it's one hour. Thank you so much for coming to join us for this conversation. Thank you, Martha. Thank you.